Sorry, guys, you missed the first part. I will add that in at the end after everyone else goes home. So you have it if you're listening to the recording, which I'm going to assume a lot of people are doing since there's very few people here in the auditorium and not that many people virtually. So I want to be sure I got that recording going. I'm glad I remembered it now. Anyway, I think someone's at the door. All right, so last but not least, from my point of view, the single most important, somebody's at the door, guys. So really most important is tissue perfusion. Yeah, somebody's at the door. Okay, tissue perfusion, which is always evaluated as metabolic acidosis. So for us in our clinical practice, we're gonna correlate the base deficit. The purpose of your base is to buffer acid, period. Base buffers acid. And the acid it buffers is metabolic acid. So when metabolic acid goes up, it gets buffered by the base. And now the base in circulation goes down. That's why we look at base deficit. We can also use bicarb. So I just want to remind you, base and bicarb travel in the same direction. They both go down when metabolic acid is up. So when you're looking at a blood gas, when you're thinking about evaluating a chemistry, when you're doing other measures, and you see on your chemistry profile here at Grady, at Grady, we call that the serum CO2, that is bicarb. Other hospitals, it comes back on the chemistry as bicarb. For us, it's serum CO2 on your chemistry. When that's down, Metabolic acid, I have no idea why this happens. Metabolic acid goes up. So it's okay, we can just keep talking, right? Metabolic acid goes up. When your base is down, that means metabolic acid is up. When your bicarb is down, that means metabolic acid is up. I've got a patient who has a compensatory tachycardia. I come in the room, they have a fast heart rate. They also have a fast respiratory rate. Both of those, I'm going to assume, are compensatory metabolic acidosis. That's pretty straightforward. I don't know why the system does that. Okay, it says wait until the system warms up. Moses is no longer here, but this is kind of a strange thing. Okay, so really, really important. We're all going to be aware, always going to be aware that metabolic acidosis is vitally important in terms of, so screen should come down. Hopefully in a moment, it's still saying that this, now the system is going to shut down again. Okay, so um, if you have the link on your phone, just if you've got the link, because I sent you the link, not the link for last week's lecture, but the overall virtual link while this is happening, you can look up here. We're going to hope. All right, let's see if this will. Here we go. Yay. Uh, I have no idea why it comes on and off, but no problem. Sorry, guys on the phone. Sorry, sorry. All right. So let's then think about this base deficit as a reflection metabolic acidosis, and then something else that will be discussed on your exam. And that is looking at the saturation or desaturation of hemoglobin after blood has left the left ventricle, diffused through the system delivered oxygen at the cell, and returned to the central vein. That's called SCVO2, SCVO2. Okay. Oh, yeah, you like it. Okay. I just cannot tell you what's going on. So here we go. Yes, back again. Okay. So really, really important, SCVO2. It's a blood gas that is drawn from the distal tip of your central line. 
and really should always be somewhere around 65 to 85% saturated, okay? The blood. So if I went out at 100% sat and I came back at 65%, it means that the patient has used 35% of the available oxygen because the tissues needed it. Now you've got a person with persistent tachycardia, persistent tachypnea with a base deficit or a low bicarb, which means metabolic acidosis. And when you look at that SCVO2, it's 40%, which means your patient is using a lot of oxygen, a lot of oxygen. Okay, your patient is on the brink of shock if they're not already in shock. Now you got to figure out what kind of shock they have. And everything you need to know will be presented to you in the question, in the overall evaluation. Okay, so heart rate, respiratory rate, base and bicarb, SCVO2, and calculated or assumed SVR. Okay, really, really, really important. All right, now we think about our flow of blood. Very important for us to remember the flow of blood is initiated by the left ventricle. So what you're seeing to your far left at the peak is LV systole and at the bottom is LV diastole. So LV systole actually has to generate enough pressure to open the aortic valve and eject blood out, okay? So you see here, the LV is generating systolic pressure because the LV is contracting against its lung. That opens up the aortic valve. And here it's at 120, right around 120. And in the systemic artery, it's gonna be very similar. So when I see a patient who has systemic arterial pressure at 220, that means my LV has to generate a pressure of 220 to open the aortic valve and bolus the blood out. Uh, that's an extraordinarily difficult amount of work. That's what puts a tremendous workload on your LV. So when you have hypertension that's not controlled, you have already put your LV at risk. It's working too hard. Everybody good? All right. And you can see that the filling of the ventricle, the filling pressure of the ventricle is very, very low. If the ventricle relaxes, it's going to be easy to fill it. Remember, we're going to look at that filling pressure as pulmonary capillary wedge or pulmonary artery diastolic pressure. You don't have a PA catheter. You're going to look at the filling pressure by looking at the chest X-ray. If your lungs are wet, you're assuming it's hard to fill the LV. Cool? Okay. So LV ejects that blood out into the systemic artery, and what changes radically is the diastolic pressure. Why? Because the arteries have a lot of tone, and they're vasoconstricted. And they're vasoconstricted or vasodilated, depending on the amount of volume, in order to maintain an average pressure throughout the whole cycle. That average pressure is the mean arterial pressure. That average pressure, the mean arterial pressure, is designed to maintain blood flow from the arterial to the capillary, to the venule, to the vein, ultimately back to the right heart. So by the way, MAP minus CVP, just MAP minus CVP should always be greater than 50. Now, if I have right heart failure and my CVP went up, should always be greater than 50. You'd like it to be 60, 65, 70, but it needs to be greater than 50. I have right heart failure and secondarily I have left heart failure. My CVP is up, but my left heart isn't very functional. So my MAP has gone down and the difference between the two is less than 50. You're in shock. Okay, now they're not gonna ask you to tell you about the MAP CVP gradient. That's something that is easy for you to apply, MAP minus CVP. That's the amount of work that the ventricle must generate in order to flow blood because ultimately the blood flow terminates at the right atrium. So your artery, your arterial, your capillary, your venule, your vein, ultimately back to the right atrium. Your LV must be able to generate an adequate pressure difference. That's really what your MAP is about in order for blood to flow back to the right heart, okay? So that's gonna be really, really important. Okay, so again, thinking about stroke volume because the focus is gonna be stroke volume. 
The majority of people are monitoring stroke volume. We do that with the flow track. We do that with a starling. We do that with a clear site, or we assume it by systole minus diastole, continuous. You can't do it intermittently with automatic blood pressure cuff. Pulse pressure, systole minus diastole, correlates with stroke volume. The universal focus today is stroke volume. And so there will be discussions about stroke volume. I can get your stroke volume from an echocardiogram. I can get your stroke volume from your A-line. I can get it with the transducer called flow track. I can get it with the transducer on your digit or clear site. I can get it with intrathoracic volume. No one's gonna ask, no one's gonna say, well, you looked at it with flow track, is it right or wrong? No, they're just gonna say stroke volume. Okay, so we wanna remember stroke volume is the amount of volume ejected by the LV per beat. And when we talk about stroke volume here, we're talking about the systemic artery. What is the volume in the systemic artery? So remember that normally, and that is something you must remember, is 60 to 100. If I'm hypovolemic, my stroke volume is down. If I have cardiac shock, my stroke volume is down. If I have anaphylaxis and a healthy heart, if I have sepsis and my heart is still healthy, my stroke volume will be up. Okay, pretty straightforward, right? The heart is truly the center of survival here because the heart is compensating your blood flow dynamic to preserve blood flow to the tissues. This is really important to us, okay? So it's a really incredible concept. Remember, cardiac output, which is heart rate times stroke volume, is the most important component that you manipulate and that the patient themselves manipulates, the most important component of the delivery of oxygen to the cells. The only purpose of cardiac output is to deliver oxygen to the cells. That's what mean pressure is about. That's what blood flow is about. It's all ultimately about delivery of oxygen to the cells, which is why there will always be, and when we're talking about shock, there will always be something added to your general clinical review. And that would be the presence or absence of metabolic acid. So base down, bicarb down, SVO2 down, metabolic acidosis. Okay, so I like to always remind you stroke volume with echocardiogram, we talk about that as EF. EF is the percent of volume that filled the ventricle that gets ejected. And then with an A-line or the difference between systole and diastole, that actually trends with your blood flow dynamic. And it's a really important component. So it's really, really, really important to remember the number one thing that we do when we see that somebody has a low stroke volume is we ask two questions and they're really important. The first is, does my patient have volume, yes or no? If the answer is yes, where is it? Is it in the pulmonary bed? Is it in the systemic bed? Because it's not in the arteries because the patient's hypotensive. So when I come to the bedside, I'm trying to evaluate somebody, hypovolemic shock or cardiogenic shock or septic shock. When I'm looking at that patient, I'm saying, do they have volume, yes or no? They're hypotensive and their CVP is low, they do not have volume. They're hypotensive and their CVP is high, they have volume, it's in the wrong place. If you don't have volume, I'm giving you volume. If you've got volume and it's in the wrong place, I'm gonna primarily look at some kind of vasodilation and some type of inotropic support because I need to move the volume from one place to the next. So that's gonna be really, really important. The major focus will be on CVP because CVP is something that people commonly use. Remember, CVP is not a volume measure. It's looking at the amount of pressure generated when the RV fills. So if I gave you right now, you don't have hypertension or anything. You've got a nice, healthy heart. You look like you're in pretty good shape. You exercise. If I gave you four liters of volume right now, your starting CVP was five. And now your CVP is six because you have a compliant right ventricle. 
But if I have a patient whose right ventricle is non-compliant and I give them two liters of volume, their CVP is going to go up significantly because the chamber is not compliant. The whole purpose here is your RV needs to be compliant. Your LV needs to be compliant, but not nearly as compliant as the RV. Because remember, the LV is a bigger muscle, so it's a little more tense, okay? This is really important to us when we're thinking about our patients. Okay, so that really lends itself very well to talking about heart failure, right? There are really two issues in heart failure. Failure to fill, failure to eject. So take a look. When you look at this picture, this fantastic picture on the internet that really gives you the visual. Okay, to the left, this is diastolic failure because your ventricle is stiff and the walls are thick. So this is, in this picture, is a patient with what we call diastolic dysfunction, failure to fill, which means volume is going to extravasate into the veins. You may have an okay ejection fraction, but your stroke volume stinks because you didn't get volume into the heart because the heart was too stiff. This is diastolic dysfunction. And then to the right is systolic dysfunction. Systolic dysfunction is failure to eject. Okay. Now, sometimes you have both. Sometimes we separate them. Patient has primary diastolic dysfunction, but preserved ejection fraction. Patient has primary uh, systolic dysfunction with a reduced ejection fraction. It's really important to appreciate those differences. Okay, so normal left ventricular ejection fraction by echo, 50 to 75%. You probably need to know that number. 50 to 75% is your normal LV ejection fraction. That means 50% of the volume that filled the ventricle is ejected. Okay, 50% of 300 is what? 150. 50% of 100 is what? 50, okay. So ejection fraction doesn't tell me truly about stroke volume. It just tells me about ventricular efficiency, okay? I've got a, a flow track and I've got a patient with an ejection fraction of 150, I mean, a, a stroke volume of 150. I'm already assuming they have a pretty good ejection fraction. And then I have a patient who has a stroke volume of 50 and I'm like, okay, that stroke volume is low. Now my question is, do you have volume, yes or no? And where is it? If the answer is no, you don't have volume, you're gonna get volume. If the answer is yes, you have volume, but it's in the venous bed, I'm gonna to need to give you kind of trouble. Now it's never that straightforward clinically. Oh, God, wouldn't it be great if it was? It's not that straightforward clinically, but on an exam, it's going to be very straightforward. You're going to pay attention. Knowing in your mind, the question is, do you have volume, yes or no, and where is it? It will all be spelled out for you. Their lungs are wet. They gained 10 pounds. They told you they can't get their shoes on, and they're hypotensive. Do they have volume? Yes. Is it in the right space? No. Okay, so you might start with diuresis. That may or may not work because if they're not actually flowing effective blood, they don't have effective blood flow to the kidney, they may not diurese. But we're gonna start with diuresis typically if we think a patient has heart failure. Okay, so remember that heart failure is basically defined as your ventricle cannot eject appropriate volume to the system carrying oxygen demand. Now there's a basic determination of severity of heart failure, and this is the basic New York Heart Association classification, class one, two, three, and four. Now they also talk about A, B, C, D, E. We're not gonna worry about that. You're not gonna have a question that says, what class heart failure are you gonna put the patient in? This is the CCRN, it's not the cardiac medical certification. So just want you to know you have different levels of heart failure. So I wanna remind you what my concern is when we're talking about this is heart failure that you participate in. The heart failure that you participate in is if you are not recognizing the presence of STEMI and patients persist with loss of myocardium under your care.
That's the one thing we have some control over. If we're recognizing that you have a STEMI, we're gonna activate as quickly as possible, get you to a cath lab so we can open your artery, right? People have heart failure because they have postpartum or peripartum cardiomyopathy. They have viral cardiomyopathy. They have valve induced heart failure because they have stenosis or regurge. They have endocarditis. Lots of things cause heart failure. What I want you to remember is the urgency of evaluation of STEMI. Remember STEMI, clinical context, EKG changes, troponin. That when you see that clinical context and EKG changes, you've got to start really quickly activating for patients so that we can reduce the amount of muscle loss. The more muscle you lose, the more likely you're going to be at heart failure. Make sense? Okay. All right. So want to remind you in compensatory mechanisms and what we talk about is when you have a low cardiac output, that actually is perceived by your baroreceptor or baroreceptors that then communicate to the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus says to the medulla oblongata, deliver sympathetic stimulation. Sympathetic stimulation is designed to increase the heart rate, to increase the contractility of the myocardium, and to promote vasoconstriction, those three things, okay? So sympathetic stimulation, uh, there are other things, but in terms of the heart, that's what we're talking about. Increase heart rate, increase contraction, vasoconstriction. Now, sympathetic activation doesn't stand alone. You can have nerve system stimulation but you also have to have neurotransmitters. And those neurotransmitters you're very familiar with because you give them every day exogenously, and that would be norepinephrine and epinephrine. Norepinephrine and epinephrine are made in the middle of the adrenal gland, the adrenal medulla. So when you have sympathetic activation, you're gonna increase your production of norepinephrine and epinephrine because without that, you can fire an impulse but it has to be taken up at the receptor site and norepinephrine, epinephrine, carry the impulse across that space. So you must have normal nervous system function, right? No spinal cord injury, no high spinal cord injury where you've lost sympathetic activation. You must have a functional adrenal gland in order to manifest a response, that neural humoral response when tissues are asking for more oxygen. Okay, now your septic, have at it, man. Have as much sympathetic activation as you can. I'm gonna give you more. I'm gonna give you norepinephrine, epinephrine, I'm titrating them up. I want you to have a lot of sympathetic activation. You had a spinal cord injury, I'm gonna give you stimulation that directly stimulates your receptor sites. That's, that's norepinephrine, epinephrine, or even better in that case, phenylephrine. I'm going to give you phenylephrine if you have post-anesthesia shock. But when I come to a patient who has cardiac failure, I need for them not to be stimulating their heart so much. So that's why we use beta blockers. We want to reduce the activity of the heart because the more sympathetic stimulation that's taken up at the heart, the more the heart in, uh, increases its demand for oxygen. So that's why beta block therapy is one of the most common therapies that we look at in heart failure. Okay, now what does that mean? That means that I have reduced the compensatory response. I have reduced your heart rate. I have reduced your contractility. So overall, your cardiac output is gonna stay low. And I have to make that decision at the bedside. You're not gonna to need to make it on an exam, but at the bedside, is the risk of, re of, of protecting the myocardium worth the risk of infarcting all of your cells? And that's why, again, in cardiogenic shock, you're not gonna get a beta blocker. I'm gonna give you norepinephrine and epinephrine because you're in shock. If you're septic and you have some cardiac failure, you're still gonna get epinephrine and norepinephrine. Right, so I always have to think about it in the context. If your problem is heart failure, I wanna reduce your myocardial oxygen demand. 
and consumption. I'm going to start with diuresis and beta block therapy. Good? Okay. No, I didn't say that. Sympathetic stimulation beta, beta increases heart rate and increases myocardial contractility, beta stem. The alpha component increases your vascular tone, meaning vasoconstriction. Your blood pressure may or may not go up. I mean, again, clinically, you got to stop working under this misnomer of, oh, if I've got my patient on 100 norepinephrine, their blood pressure should go up. Okay, you're vasoconstricting the patient, but you're not assuring they have blood flow. That's the problem. And you're, you're at the bedside titrating up like crazy. I need for you to be thinking clinically. The exam isn't going to ask you that. That's more complex. But clinically, when you're titrating up on vasopressors, you need to be aware that you're putting an inordinate demand on the myocardium. So you have to be cautious. It's always a balance. Okay, beta stimulation, increased heart rate, increased myocardial contractility. Other things as well, but we're only talking about the heart right now. Increased heart rate, increased contractility, beta stim, that's sympathetic. Alpha stim, also sympathetic. Vasoconstriction, mostly in the arteries, secondarily in the veins. Beta stim, heart rate, contractility. Alpha stim, artery and veno constriction. Norepinephrine, alpha greater than beta. Epi, beta greater than alpha at low dose, alpha greater than beta, beta at a higher dose. So that's why cardiac surgeons put a patient on epinephrine because they're getting some beta and alpha. Whereas in septic shock, you're going to use norepinephrine. But as soon as you discover your patient may have myocardial dysfunction, you're going to have to consider something that increases inotropic effect. So that might be epi, might be dobutamine. Okay, kind of getting ahead of myself there. Okay, the next activation that in heart failure plays an extraordinary role is the activation, sorry, I thought I had a little picture there, that's okay, of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. The renin angiotensin aldosterone system is regulated by the blood volume and the blood pressure at the filter of the kidney, at the glomerulus. At the filter of the kidney, the filter releases a hormone renin, which converts by meeting another hormone that's released by the liver, angiotensinogen. That then activates angiotensinogen renin into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 in the blood goes to the lung where the item you care about actually occurs, and that is angiotensin 2. Now, that's disrupted when you have ARDS. It's also disrupted when you have renal failure. Angiotensin 2 also stimulates the release of aldosterone, another hormone. Angiotensin II is the most potent vasoconstrictor known to man. So when you have a patient who has poor renal flow, has liver failure, has lung failure, in your mind, you need to say they have low circulating angiotensin II, which is another reason that they're hypotensive. Now we can replace angiotensin II, but it's not a common practice. So the AACN will not be asking you that on your exam. But in your clinical practice, you need to know that you can replace angiotensin II in a person who has refractory shock. And that is with a drug called Giapreza, which is angiotensin II. We should be thinking about it very early on. We should think about it early on with patients who have refractory hypotension. We've started vasopressor. We've got two vasopressors and vasopressin. Don't be waiting a day, two days, three days. Patient's almost dead. Now let's give angiotensin II. Why would we do that? That's silly. You got to do it early. Okay, that's clinical, won't be on your exam. So, a conversion to angiotensin II. Angiotensin II is a profound vasoconstrictor, and it also stimulates the release of aldosterone. So, remember, the kidney says, Help me. I don't have blood flow and I don't have blood pressure. 
And the response hormonally is release renin, ultimately convert to angiotensin II, vasoconstrict, reabsorb salt and water. Well, all of that is fantastic if you're a 20 year old with a healthy heart who's bleeding out on the street. If you're a 35 year old, a 50 year old, a 70 year old with heart failure, that puts an extraordinary burden on your heart because now I'm more vasoconstricted and I have more volume to move, but I have a heart that isn't able to do it, which is why we block this. We block this with ACE inhibition, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibition. That actually works at the lung surface. Remember, really is gonna depend on how functional your lung is. Or we use angiotensin receptor blocker. ACE inhibitors always end with the word, with the four letters, P-R-I-L, PRIL. ACE inhibitors always end with PRIL. So when you see on an exam that you have a patient with heart failure who's on enalapril or captopril, you know that they're on ACE inhibition. Angiotensin receptor blockers always end with the five, six letters. Sartin, losartin is an angiotensin receptor block. Okay. ACE is more effective. ARB is a little lower down the mechanism, but both will ultimately block the uptake of the angiotensin or conversion of the angiotensin so that the patient is not so vasoconstricted. Now, if I reduce vasoconstriction, I make it easier, assumably, easier for the heart to eject. The more vasoconstricted you are, the harder it is for the heart to eject. So again, Prill and Sartan, with that at the end, is telling you what your focus is, ACE inhibition or angiotensin receptor blocker. You're blocking this renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Now, the other agent that we use is what's known as a potassium-sparing diuretic. That potassium sparing diuretic is aldactone or spirolactone. And what that basically is doing is blocking aldosterone, which means I'm going to waste salt and I'm going to waste water. I'm going to waste more water than I waste salt. I'm going to waste salt. I'm going to waste water. And at that compartment of the kidney, which is the distal tubule of the kidney, that means that I'm going to reabsorb potassium. That's why it's called the potassium sparing diuretic. But what I want you to appreciate is the regulation of salt and water is incredibly important here in terms of protecting your patient, okay? And we don't use nasiratide. Nobody's really using it uh, except in Europe, so it won't be on your exam. Okay, so the end result of this sympathetic activation, this angi renin angiotensin aldosterone activation, the heart rate goes up, contractility goes up, you vasoconstrict, you're reabsorbing sodium and water. And as long as your heart is good, that will increase your cardiac output and your blood pressure. But when your heart is bad, it's gonna make things worse. Does that make sense to everybody? So again, I come to the bedside in a patient who's not been diagnosed, isn't on meds, I'm just looking at them. They have an increased heart rate, they have increased contractility. I'm gonna assume they also have vasoconstriction. Their urine output has gone down. I'm going to say this is a compensatory response. All depends on the efficacy of your heart. If your heart is not functional, this is going to make you worse. If your heart is functional, this is going to make you better. Okay. So you're a 22 year old in a motor vehicle collision and you've severed your spinal cord. Okay. And you've several, severed your spinal cord above. C5. So you have now lost your sympathetic activation, right? You survive because of your hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine, and renin, angiotensin, aldosterone. You survive that injury. Even though you lost your spinal cord, you survive that injury. Now, that's, a, that's not great, but it generates survival. But that patient in neurogenic shock has an inadequacy of renin angiotensin aldosterone and or neurotransmitters. It's not good enough. And now the patient is profoundly hypotensive. Also be typically 
typically, not always, profoundly proud of Carter because they've lost sympathetic activation. Beta, heart rate and contractility, alpha, vasoconstrictor. Cool? Okay. All right. So something else that's also very, very important here is that the neural humoral mechanisms, both sympathetic activation and renin angiotensin aldosterone are actually first and foremost gonna cause more volume to go back to the heart, which then is gonna cause dilation. So when we're looking at this or echo is described or there's discussion about it, we're gonna remind ourselves that you may be vasodilated. I mean, uh, ventricular dilated, that the internal chamber is large, okay? No one's gonna put an echo up here for you to interpret. No one's gonna give you echo numbers. It's gonna say by echo, the decision has been made that the, ventric the left ventricular chamber is dilated. Okay, well, that tells you already, they've got a dilated LV, they're in heart failure, okay? And over time, what you're gonna see is, um, more and more and more muscle tissue that is dysfunctional. Now, if I had an MI and I've infarcted tissue, that tissue will ultimately become scar tissue. And that's called ventricular remodeling. So I wanna make sure, because there may be a question that kind of talks about this. The only way to reduce ventricular remodeling is with ACE and ARB. So typically after an MI, and we are concerned about the evolution of heart failure, you're gonna get placed on an ACE, remember that ends with PRIL, or an ARB that ends with SARTAN in order to protect your myocardium. So you might get a question on your exam after patients had a, a large anterior wall MI, he's been placed on a beta blocker and angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. And what's the purpose? Okay, answer all that apply. Will that promote water wasting? Yes. Will that promote salt wasting? Yes. Will that promote potassium wasting? No. Will that protect you from ventricular remodeling? Yes. So really important to remember that is the only agent, that's the only class are these angiotensin uh, converter enzyme inhibitors or receptor blockers currently are the only class of drug that protects you from ventricular remodeling, which is the production of dysfunctional cells, which ultimately will end up with a thickening of the wall, making you much worse. Good? Okay, excellent. Okay. So pretty straightforward. When we talk about heart failure, what's your first question at the bedside or looking at an exam? Do you have volume? Yes or no? Typically with heart failure, the way it would be described typically on an exam, you will have volume, but it's in the wrong space. So it's in the veins. If it's in the pulmonary veins, that will extravasate to pulmonary edema. If it's in the systemic veins, it will extravasate to systemic edema. And when both sides of the heart, biventricular failure occurs, which will ultimately always happen, you'll always start with one and end up with both. You'll have both pulmonary edema and systemic edema. Because volume is in the veins and then it escapes into the interstitial. So with LV failure, some of the first things you're going to see is shortness of breath, right? And that shortness of breath can be described in many ways, right? So we'll talk about it as dyspnea, shortness of breath. We talk about it as paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, PND. That means when I go to bed at night and I lay down, I wake up feeling like I can't breathe because I've gotten a lot of volume back to the left heart when I lay down. Because right now, especially if I've got heart failure, most of my volume is to my leg. I've got heart failure. Most of my volume is to my legs. The CVP is up, so it's not easy for volume to return to the right heart because I have a non-compliant right ventricle. When I lay down, I've changed the gradient. Volume returns to the heart. I get acutely short of breath. I wake up with severe shortness of breath. That's called PND. 
well, okay, I've had PND for a while. So what I learned was I need to have three pillows at night or I need to lay or, or sit in a lounge chair. I still put my legs up, but now the head is up, okay? So that's called orthopnea. Orthopnea means I can no longer lay flat. I have to be elevated. My head and my heart have to be elevated. So those are the describers. I'm acutely short of breath. Whenever I do anything, I get short of breath. When I fall asleep at night, I wake up two hours after I've fallen asleep, feeling like I'm suffocating. So I learned from that not to lay down. And I sleep in a chaise lounge. Okay. Well, all of this, of course, is going to make me tired. Number one, I'm tired because I can't generate enough blood flow with oxygen delivery to maintain my cells. So I always feel tired. Really, really important to remember that particularly with women, these are the two major complaints that women have, and they historically have been dismissed. You're a woman, you're working, you're raising children, you're keeping the house, you're paying the bills. Yeah, no wonder you're tired. You're tired. Get with it. Okay, no. When I'm tired and I talk about increasing shortness of breath, I should always be evaluated for myocardial dysfunction. And particularly as a woman, as an elder, and as a diabetic, okay? That doesn't mean that we're excluding men. It's just that men tend to present differently than women do, okay? Now, remember, we've got volume, but it's in the wrong space. So my urine output has gone down. I have fluid retention. It might be in the lungs. It might be in the system. It might be in both places, right? If it's pure LV failure, it'll be in the lungs. If it's pure RV failure, it'll be in the system. If it's biventricular failure, it'll be in both, okay? I can't really, when, when we see exercise tolerance, we're not saying, can you run a 5K? We're saying, when you walk to your mailbox, when you go up one flight of stairs to get to your bedroom, and you're telling me that you're short of breath when that happens, that's a reduced exercise tolerance. So one of the things we might do when we evaluate you is we're going we're gonna to put you on a treadmill and look what happens, right? Because we're going to measure your exercise tolerance, okay? Now, because you're vasoconstricted as a compensatory response, right? Typically, your periphery, your hands and your feet will be cool. They may be modeled. You may have poor capillary refill. That's really important. Always remember that the compensatory response is to vasoconstrict. So in hypovolemia and in cardiogenic shock, typically your digits will be cool and they may have a change in color. And you may be trying to figure out clinically, you're putting a pulse oximeter on the left index finger and then the right index finger and you can't get a pulsatile reading, which means you can't get a sac because you don't have blood flow. You don't have optimal blood flow to your digits. If you're having to switch your pulse oximetry sensor more than once, your patient has poor blood flow. And you should use that to guide you when you're evaluating your patients, okay? Got to have blood flow to be able to read saturated hemoglobin. Okay, so again, just remember that with heart failure, your heart rate will go up, but your stroke volume goes down. Okay, you've got a high volume load in the vein. You have vasoconstriction, that's afterload. And all of it is about the loss of your contractile mechanism. Preload. The pressure of filling with volume. Afterload. The resistance the ventricle must work against, which actually generates tension. The harder the work, the more tension. The more tension, the more oxygen the myocardium itself is going to consume. And contractility, the inherent property of the myocardial cells to slide across each other, making the chamber smaller, making the pressure go up. Preload, afterload, contractility. In heart failure, first, we're going to try to reduce preload. We're going to do that with a diuretic. Second, we're going to try to reduce your afterload. We'll do that with the vasodilator. 
we will also look at reducing myocardial demand for oxygen by using beta block. And we will add in an ACE inhibitor, which is actually going to affect preload and afterload. And in the distance, your contractile state. All right. So I always love to just talk about heart failure in this way, looking at heart failure one, two, three, and four. This is pretty straightforward. This is actually very scientific. All you have to do is think about this as it relates, okay? So number one, your patient is warm. That means their digits are warm and dry. That means there's no evidence of volume in the pulmonary bed and no evidence of volume in the volume stasis in the pulmonary or systemic bed, venous bed. That means they're dry, warm and dry, okay? Then you move to cold and dry. Cold and dry means your digits are cold, but you don't have volume extravasation in the interstitium because you don't have filling failure, you have ejection failure. That's why you're cold. When we're talking about heart failure, we're not talking about somebody who was found down on the street in the winter, we're talking about heart failure. We talk about patients who are warm and wet. Well, they still have ejection, but they have a failure to fill. And then the worst, which is cardiogenic shock or class four heart failure. They're cold and wet. They've got volume that's in the interstitium and they don't have blood flow, okay? So all we have to really remind ourselves is our question is, I'm still gonna say the same thing. Do you have volume, yes or no, and where is it? Okay, if I'm warm and dry, I'm probably moving volume appropriately. So it fills the veins and it goes to the arteries. If I'm warm and wet, I have volume stasis in the veins, but I'm still ejecting. So I still have volume in the artery, but I have more volume in the vein. Okay, if I still have volume in the artery, I'm gonna give you a diuretic because you got volume in the artery, right? If you are cold, and dry, you have failure of ejection, you're probably going to need a ninotrope. And if you are cold and wet, we're going to consider that cardiogenic shock. You're going to get everything. You're going to get everything I can throw at you to try to improve your outcome. And most likely, if you're in cardiogenic shock in today's world, we're going to think about if the patient fails primary medical therapy, which would be diuresis, beta block, inotrope. Diuresis, beta block, inotrope. If you fail that, you're going to get a VAD uh, or ventricular assist device. You might get an impeller and you're going to get put on a list for a heart transplant. Okay. Now, for us, just this is the AACN, so they're, they may not be fully uh, looking at equity in healthcare, but for us, because our patients are poor because they don't have insurance and because many of them don't have a life that lends itself well to the management of transplant, a lot of our patients don't qualify for transplant. But that is the natural evolution. So you're warm and wet, inotrope, I'm, I'm sorry, warm and wet, diuresis, ACE inhibition, diuresis. You're cold and dry, inotrope and volume, probably vasodilation. You're cold and wet, inotrope, vasodilation, ACE inhibitor, beta block. You fail that, you're getting mechanical circulatory support. So that's that would be, no one's asking you, would you rather give a balloon pump or an impella? Would you rather give an impella or a VAD? It's just, if you fail medical therapy, you're gonna need mechanical circulatory support, that's MCS. So when you fail primarily, primary medical therapy, you're gonna move to mechanical circulatory support and you're in cardiogenic shock. At class four, so we have people that live in class four, but just barely, and then they get an infection, they go directly into cardiogenic shock because they can't compensate. Cool, everybody feels pretty good? Yeah, okay, good. So always, uh, again, I just feel it's so important. The question is, do you have volume, yes or no? 
Remember when filling pressures are up, you have evidence of volume extravasation, pulmonary edema or systemic edema. When arterial pressures are normal to down, but you have evidence of arterial hypoperfusion, that means base and bicarb are down, which means metabolic acid is up, SVO2 or SCVO2 are down, and it doesn't matter if the term is SVO2 or SCVO2, anything below 60% means it's down. Doesn't matter where you measured it, it's down. It matters if it's central vein or pulmonary vein, pulmonary artery, but 60% or lower means that you're at risk and that you are arterially hypoperfused. So remember, if the left heart is dysfunctional, you're gonna have a cold periphery. The right heart is dysfunctional, and that's gonna be a little bit higher. Neck veins will be the standard, systemic edema is present, but the lungs are dry. Okay, so that just brings us to basic physical examination. These are the kind of things that are gonna be described for you. When cardiac output is down, extremities are gonna be cold, the pulses are gonna be weak, you're gonna have acidosis, base, bicarb, SVO2 down. Okay, you gotta figure out why you have a decrease in cardiac output. So the question then becomes, do you have volume, yes or no? You've got cold extremities, distant pulses, base deficit, bicarb's low, SVO2 is down. Now I'm gonna say, do you have volume? If you have volume in the pulmonary bed and you've got pulmonary edema, the answer is yes. Is it in the right place? No. If I have volume in the systemic bed, I have systemic edema, I've gained weight, can't put my shoes on, my neck veins are distended. I have volume, but it's in the wrong place. Good, that you get from a physical exam. And you get that from basically from looking at the neck veins and your X-ray. Now there are gonna be some abnormal heart sounds that will be described to you. You're taking an exam, it's pen and paper or it's electronic. You're not really listening to someone's heart. But S3, either right side or left side, depending on which, which is the failing heart, the stiff heart, S3 indicates in the early stage of filling, the heart is stiff. So I get, I'll have a description. Your patient has cold extremities, you can't get a pulse ox, you look at the blood gases, patient's got a base deficit, uh, the pH is down, um, the neck veins are, are distended and I hear an S3. Okay, your patient's in heart failure. You've got volume, wrong place, and I have a sound, the S3, which is stiff heart. And S4 is an over-distended heart. And S3 is a stiff heart. S4 is a distended heart. Now, we may or may not get the number of SVR. So let's remember, normal SVR, 800 to 1,200. If my cardiac output is down, that's the denominator, the SVR calculation will be up. It's all about that cardiac output. It's not really about your blood pressure. Your blood pressure might be normal, but your hands and feet are cold and you have distant pulses. Your blood pressure is okay right now. Your blood pressure is okay. Blood pressure drops as one of the latest signs of shock. It's not an early sign. By the time you see somebody profoundly hypotensive, by the way, my friends, you have missed a lot of information because prior to your blood pressure dropping, unless it's a direct failure of your vessel, prior to blood pressure dropping, you typically have clues. Heart rate's been up. Respiratory rate is up. Base has been trending downwards. You have some clues and lots of times you're communicating those clues and maybe nobody is acting on them but it is really important to pay attention to those clues. And again, on your exam, the clues are gonna be what's discussed, okay? Now, if the SVR is down, if SVR is down, that means your cardiac output is up. Your cardiac output is up typically because it's compensatory to a loss of vascular tone. I wanna remind you clinically that what you're trying to manipulate when you give volume or inotrope is the systolic blood pressure in the artery. You're trying to manipulate systolic pressure when you give volume, when you give an inotrope. When your patient's lost vascular tone, you are trying to manipulate the diastolic pressure with your vasopressors. So you should always see diastolic pressure and therefore mean pressure come up when you add vasopressors if your patient's responsive. 
and volume or inotrope, you should always see the systolic pressure come up. Now, both of them will come up, but what you're focused on with volume and inotrope is systolic pressure. And what you're focused on with vasopressor is diastolic pressure and mean arterial pressure. So when you're at the bedside and you're, you're titrating up on norepinephrine and epinephrine and your systolic pressure is coming down and your diastolic pressure is not coming up, okay, systolic pressure is coming down, you're titrating up and up and up and what the heck? The systolic pressure is coming down. What have you actually done? Have you improved cardiac function or reduced cardiac function? You've reduced cardiac function. And that's when you know enough is enough. Because it isn't doing what I wanted it to do, which was to raise the diastolic pressure. Now I have to think outside of my box of, I'm going to just titrate your norepinephrine to 150 because that's what says in my MAR that I can titrate to 150. Ha ha, look how autonomous I am. I'm doing a great job going up. I start in the ED, you have hypotension. I start to 130 of norepinephrine. I don't give you a trial. I don't say, I'm going to start low and then I'm going to double and then I'm going to go up again. And I do that every five minutes because I'm going to give you five minutes to respond. Now your patient's going to die. So you're their blood pressure is 30, you're going to put them on a higher dose. But then your goal would be to reduce that dose slowly until you see that they drop their diastolic pressure and then you go back up. Just not titrating to the highest degree because you can. Because if your patient isn't responding, that's not the right therapy, right? Everybody good? Okay. So remember, we're going to look at an echocardiogram. That's going to be really important. That helps us to actually see uh, the function, most particularly the functional muscle mass of the LV, and also very, very important, the direction of your septum. Septum separates the right and left ventricle, and the septal wall on LV contraction, the septal wall should shift to the right heart. That's, that's the only thing that anyone will expect you to know, that you have wall motion and that the septum should actually shift towards the right ventricle on LV contraction because the pressure is high. If the septum is shifted into the left ventricle, you have right ventricular failure. So septal wall, let me do that in front of this. I think you can see me. The septal wall separates the right and left heart. This is the left heart. So you're looking at me, but I'm the, I'm the patient. This is my left heart. When my left heart starts to contract, the septum bows over into the right ventricle, and then it comes back. Bows to the right ventricle, and then it comes back. If the septum is flat, or if the septum bows over into the LV, you have right ventricular dysfunction, or you have septal abnormality. Okay, that's really important. That's the only thing. With echo, you need to know what a normal EF is, 50 to 75%, and you need to know about the position of the septal wall. Now, if the description of an echo is that you are akinetic, dyskinetic, hypokinetic, the LV is hypokinetic, you've lost muscle. You're likely to be in failure. So hearing words of akinetic, dyskinetic, hypokinetic, those are all bad things. Okay. And then remember, we want to draw a blood gas sample from the brown lumen, the distal port of our CVP, and very important physical examination and chemistry is the presence or absence of a natriuretic hormone. Natriuretic hormone means waste salt and therefore water. That natriuretic hormone is beta natriuretic, natriuretic peptide hormone released primarily from the cell wall of the right atria. I got a lot of volume in the right atria and the right atria is distended. The right atria wall, the tissue, releases that hormone, beta natriuretic peptide. Count of circulating beta natriuretic peptide hormone is less than 100. Anything greater than 200 indicates you have heart failure. Because you've over distended the right atria, you're releasing the hormone. That hormone is designed to promote that you're going to waste salt and water. In order for you to waste salt water from the kidney, what do you have to have at the kidney? Blood flow. 
If you don't have blood flow to the kidney, the message goes unheard. BNP goes up, 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 up. Sometimes we see people with the BNP of 2,500. They gain 20 kilograms. They can't fit into any of their clothes. Their abdomen is distended. They're wet, 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 wet. They cannot walk to the bathroom. And they have that high BNP. Their fingers are cold. You can't get a pulse ox. Their pulses are distant. No surprise. Where's their, do they have volume? Yes or no? Yes. Is it in the right space? No. That's why those questions are really important. And on an exam, what you have to appreciate is hypotension with a high CVP, volume, or hypotension with pulmonary edema, hypotension with systemic edema. You got volume. It's in the wrong space. Pretty straightforward. And at the center of that is your heart. Okay. So just to remind us about preload, preload is a pressure measure, CVP for the right heart, wedge pressure or PAD for the left heart. And it's about the compliance of the chamber and the amount of volume that fills it. Therefore, it's called filling pressure. Okay. And uh, this was actually, uh, was animated, but whatever, we've lost that. This just says that you have stasis of volume in your vein. We've already discussed that. Afterload is the resistance that the ventricle must work against. You have pulmonary afterload, you have systemic afterload. And when you see that patients have reduced forward flow, they're gonna have an increase in their vascular tone and an increase in their afterload, okay? And then we just remember when we talk about the heart, we talk about backward failure, which means ventricle back to the veins, forward failure, which means ventricle forward to the artery, okay? Left heart, backward failure, pulmonary edema, forward failure, systemic hypoperfusion. Right heart, backward failure, systemic venous engorgement, forward failure, reduction in pulmonary blood flow. Okay. When I have backward failure of one ventricle, it will ultimately affect the other. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. What did I tell you about MAP and CVP? That'd be greater than 50. I've got a patient now with a CVP of 20 and an MAP of 60. Do they have evidence of backward failure? And that backward failure is the right heart. And that now has affected the left heart and the left heart forward fa failure. Everybody with me? And I'm not maintaining that gradient where I can assume good blood flow. So do I expect that I have a base deficit? Yes or no? Yep. Do I expect that the bicarb is down? Yes. Do I expect that my SVO2 is down? Yes. Okay, perfect. All that comes back together in the way that we evaluate patients. That's the thing about the ASCN is they're going to ask you scientific questions, but they want you to be able to apply it. To look at the context of a case study and say, here are the things I think it might be. And the one that I think it most is, is going to be the right answer. Right. So I always advise people, um, I don't know if that's somebody for class, I doubt it, but I always advise people, read the answers first and then look at the context. Because once you read the answers, you say, okay, I'm looking for this, 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 or this. I'm looking for hypovolemic shock. And hypovolemic shock, do I have volume? Yes or no? Hypovolemic shock, do I have volume? Yes or no? No. So my neck veins aren't distended. My system's not wet. My lungs aren't wet. If I have a wedge pressure or PAD, that's not going to be high. On an exam, that's not going to be high. You're going to have evidence that you don't have volume. Do I have cardiogenic shock? My neck veins are distended. I've gained 10 pounds. Can't put my shoes on. My lungs are wet. Do I have volume? Yes or no? Yes. Is it in the right place if I'm hypotensive and hypoperfused? No. Cool. Pretty straightforward, right? Pretty straightforward. So we're going to apply that here. We're going to remind ourselves backward failure is evaluated by veno volume and venous pressure. Okay, well, I don't have a PA catheter and I don't have a CVP, but your lungs are wet. The x-ray shows me that your lungs are wet. You've got veno volume overload. Okay. Forward heart failure is measured in the arteries. 
You're not measuring the pulmonary artery. There won't be questions about pulmonary arterial flow. You're primarily going to be looking at LV stroke volume and LV ejection fraction. Not to say that the RV is not profoundly and incredibly important and that we see a lot of patients with primary right ventricular failure, pulmonary embolism, primary right ventricular failure, high peak, primary right ventricular failure, RV infarct, primary right ventricular failure. But that's complex and it does, in terms of diagnosis, it requires a higher uh, process level than you're going to be asked to designate. You will expect that if you've got a big PE, you're going to have systemic engorgement and a low oxygen saturation, a low PO2 and a high PCO2 because you're not flowing blood through the pulmonary artery. But nobody's going to ask you to interpret pulmonary arterial waveform to determine whether or not a patient has PE. It's just going to be evident that you have RV failure, but not LV failure. Right? When you have a PE, you have RV failure, but not LV failure because the RV is ejecting against that pulmonary embolism. Okay, so basically, this is how we're going to separate that. With your LV, you have orthopnea, you have dyspion exertion, you have crackles that may be one third, two thirds of the way up. Remember in clinical practice, exploration of crackles or rouse always needs to be lateral and posterior. Most of the time you can't hear it anteriorly, particularly if patients have been laying down, that fluid accumulation is in the posterior surface. So you got to do a posterior and lateral evaluation. Their SATs are low. They may have an S3 or an S3 and an S4. That's called a gallop. They may also have a systolic murmur. That's a murmur of regurgitation through the mitral and or the tricuspid valve. Typically, their urine output is low. And if I am looking at LV filling pressure, PAD and or wedge will be higher than 20. Okay, remember what we said, wedge pressure 8 to 12, PA diastolic pressure. 15. So something that's 18, 20, 22, that tells you you have an increased pressure because you have volustasis in the chamber. Okay. Very important. Your cardiac output is low. So your calculated SVR will be high. Your cardiac output is low. Do you have blood flow? Do you have blood volume? Do you have volume? I'm sorry. Do you have volume? Yes or no, based on this? Yes or no? Do you have volume? Yes or no? I need everyone. Yes. Do you have volume? Yes. Is it in the right space? No, because it's in the pulmonary veins. That's why your wedge pressure is up. That's why you have orthopnea. That's why you have crackles. Now let's move over to the right ventricle. The right ventricle, distended neck veins, dependent edema, hepatic engorgements, so the liver is large. Something that ASCN always loves to talk about is the hepatotricular reflex, which means I'm going to press down on your liver for 20 seconds, your neck veins distend. That's called a positive hepatotricular reflex. They always ask a question about it because they think it's really important that you know it, but you're generally not pressing on people's livers, but okay. Press down on the liver 20 seconds, the neck veins distend. Hepatojugular reflex. A positive hepatojugular reflex is a positive indicator of RV dysfunction. Now, a lot of times those patients, because they have engorgement, they have compression of some of their arteries and veins, they actually oftentimes will have some GI distress associated with this. They may be anorectic. They may also have some nausea. Okay. They may also have an S3 or an uh, S3 and S4. They may also have a systolic murmur, but now it's on the right side. No one's going to ask you to differentiate right side versus left side S3 or S4. The only differentiation that might be made is when you're looking at a regurgitating valve. If I have a tricuspid regurgitation, volume is going to be in my systemic veins and not forward into the LV because it's all going backward. So you're going to have indications of right side of failure with a tricuspid regurg. You will have indications of left side of failure with a mitral regurg because instead of volume going forward, volume will go backwards. Okay, so those are going to be really important. CVP typically going to be greater than eight, really typically going to be greater than 12. CVP greater than 12. And if you had a PA catheter, you would be calculating pulmonary vascular resistance. We're not going to worry about that. 
Okay. All right. Just remind yourself about systolic versus diastolic dysfunction. Those will be words used to describe heart failure. Systolic means failure to flow forward. Diastolic means failure to fill. That's all you have to remember. Systolic, failure to eject forward. Diastolic, failure to fill. Okay. If you don't fill the ventricle, then the ventricle doesn't have adequate volume to eject. That's why we look at an echo because we can actually see from the echo where the primary dysfunction is. If you have primary systolic failure, you're gonna have diastolic failure. If you have primary diastolic failure, you're not necessarily gonna have systolic failure, but you're gonna have a low stroke volume. Your EF is normal, but remember, if I don't fill the ventricle, the ventricle normally fills with 200 to 250 cc's of volume. If I don't fill the ventricle, I've only put 75 cc's in the ventricle. I'm still going to eject 50% of it, but it's a much lower volume than I'm ejecting. Good, everybody good? All right. So again, we go back and we just remember systolic failure, heart, uh, systolic failure, heart can't eject. Diastolic failure, heart can't fill. If I have a hypertrophied LV, I'm going to have diastolic failure. If I have a thin LV wall because it's stretched out, it's non-contractile non tissue, I've got a dilated cardiomyopathy. So if I look at this right now, I can say over here on, my, on your right side, looking at the slide on your right side, that is a dilated heart failure or a dilated cardiomyopathy. And then I look at the left side, your left side, this is a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I have LV hypertrophy. I also have RV hypertrophy. I have a hypertrophic heart. The internal chamber has gotten smaller and it's harder to fill. Filling pressure goes up. Systolic failure, can't empty. Filling pressure goes up. Diastolic failure, can't fill. Filling pressure goes up. Can't make the decision based on your filling pressure, CVP or wedge, or the presence or absence of volume in the vein, whether it's a diastolic or systolic dysfunction. The only thing that's going to tell me that is an echocardiogram. That's why echocardiogram is absolutely essential. And that's the only way to truly diagnose the problem of heart failure. You've got to have an echocardiogram. Cool? Here, here. Should be in your handout. Oh, I got you because I, I got you. I need to be aware of that. Thank you. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll build the handout and take the animation off. Sorry about that. Okay, you got it? Okay, beautiful. Okay. Tell me, if you have a dilated cardiomyopathy, the walls are thin and the chamber is large. If the walls are thin, can you contract effectively? No, it's primary. I mean, it ends, you end up with both dysfunctions, but that's a primary systolic. Your ejection fraction has gone down. With diastolic dysfunction, you have a normal ejection fraction, you just can't fill the ventricle. Because remember, ejection fraction is percent of volume that filled the ventricle that you ejected. So ejection fraction just tells us about percent of volume that you ejected. All right, so diagnostic testing, and look at a chest X-ray. Heart size may be large. You may also see what's known as curly B lines, which is pulmonary venous engorgement, we'll take a look in a second, and pleural effusions on chest X-ray. On the EKG, which is not the way for you to diagnose heart failure, absolutely do not diagnose heart failure from EKG. But on the EKG, you may see some evidence of a myocardial infarct. That means you're not depolarizing and you have deep, wide Q waves, wider than 0.04, deeper than two millimeters. That's what we talked about before. You may also have an intraventricular conduction deficit. So you might have right bundle branch block. You might have left bundle branch block might have half of your left bundle block, that's either anterior or posterior. You may have a delayed PR segment. You may have Mopitz type one. 
you may have atrial fibrillation. Remember the number one cause for atrial fib. Well, not number one, there's a lot of causes. The three things we always wanna rule out when we see new onset AFib is that your atria is distended. When your atria is distended, I'm gonna see an increase in BMP and very likely you're gonna be in AFib when your atria is distended, okay? Another cause of AFib, undiagnosed hyperthyroidism. And the third, pulmonary embolism. So three things we're gonna rule out right away with AFib, new onset AFib, distended atria, pulmonary embolism, hyperthyroidism. Okay. Hyperthyroidism. AFib, hyperthyroid. Fast atrial depolarization related to high thyroid. Okay. You can, of course, see ventricular ectopy when we look at you on a chest X-ray, an MRI, or an echo, we're going to see that the atria is enlarged. And typically, your ventricle is going to be hypertrophied. Okay, so always want to look at echo. And again, remember, no one's going to ask you to diagnose an echo. Just want to remember what we're looking at is how dilated are the chambers? Is the wall moving appropriately? And what about your septum? Okay. So descriptions would be normal wall motion, normal septum, normal valve. Normal heart, abnormal heart, hypokinetic, dyskinetic, abnormal septum, abnormal valve. And we're going to get all of that when we take a look at an echocardiogram. Lots of labs. Basic labs are going to be just your basic chemistry and the role of your electrolytes and the dissolution of sodium to water. That's going to be really important. What is your sodium? And what is your osm? Remember, sodium is the measure of circulating sodium. Awesome is sodium as it relates to water. So if sodium is low and awesome is low, I'm thinking that you have heart failure. Okay, that would be hypervolemic hyponatremia, but I'm not gonna make that decision until I get your BNP. Your BNP is 800. You have a low sodium, a low awesome, and a high BNP, you've got heart failure. I'm gonna do an echo, but I already know you got heart failure. I need to know what kind of heart failure you have. That's why I'm gonna do an echo. Okay. The other thing is I'm gonna look at liver enzymes because of the engorgement, especially with systemic edema, the engorgement of the liver, which can cause liver dysfunction. And we see it all the time in patients with heart failure. And of course, we're gonna look at your thyroid. Now, if you've got heart failure, the likelihood is that you either have uncontrolled hypothyroidism and now you have a dysfunctional myocardium or you're hypothyroid. I can't tell you which one it is without doing thyroid testing. I might be able to look at you and say what I think, but I need thyroid testing. And that should always be part of every cardiac uh, uh, evaluation. Okay, so how are we gonna treat heart failure? You gotta treat the cause. You gotta reverse the cause if you can. So if you have anatomic, anatomical problems like valvular dysfunction, valvular stenosis, valvular recurge, two or more valves in dysfunction, you've got to go to the OR. You've got to replace your valve. We might be able to do uh, uh, a non-surgical valve replacement that's known as TAPR. Okay, that's really only for the aortic valve. And it's non-surgical. It can be done in the cath lab. Don't think they'd ask you a question about it because it's not everywhere, although it's pretty prevalent. We don't do it here. Okay, but valve replacement, or if you had a septal MI, remember the septal is V1 and V2, if I had an anterior septal MI, I might now have an opening in my septum that's called a VSD, okay? So you have to have a patch. I've got to repair that if it's causing you to have hemodynamic instability. And then I want to treat the bad effects of your compensatory mechanism, right? Block beta vasodilate, block renin angiotensin aldosterone with ACE inhibition or ARBs and aldactone. I'm going to block those bad effects. They're great effects when you're a 20-year-old with a good heart who's hemorrhaging on the street. They're bad effects when you have heart failure. I've got to block those compensatory mechanisms. Compensatory mechanisms can increase your survival when your problem is not your heart. When the problem is your heart, the compensatory mechanism will kill you. 
Okay, so only time we're really going to consider blocking the compensatory mechanism is when you have myocardial dysfunction. Otherwise, we want you to have it. We're going to treat the cause, but we're not going to block the compensatory mechanism. But with heart failure, I'm blocking your compensatory mechanism. Everybody good? Because I need to reduce myocardial oxygen demand, myocardial oxygen consumption. So starting with diuretics, of course, we think about the loop diuretics that work in the loop of the kidney. They are all electrolyte wasting and water wasting. So when I give you a loop diuretic, your sodium actually gets wasted, your potassium gets wasted, your other electrolytes get wasted because they all are actually regulated in the loop of the kidney. Umex also works in the loop of the kidney. So if you're on Lasix or you're on Umex and you're being diuresed, we're going to pay a lot of attention to your electrolytes. And the most important one, because we're going to waste sodium and water in relationship to each other, but you're going to waste a lot of potassium. So um, maybe three weeks ago, I did a little talk about a patient who uh, he came into the ED. He had a cardiac arrest. He had over-diuresed himself. He was profoundly hypokalemic, 2.1. Uh, after they resuscitated him, he had return of spontaneous circulation, return of neurologic function, but his potassium was 2.1. They did aggressive potassium replacement. He said, yeah, I over myself. He had heart failure. He was diuresing himself, trying to manage himself at home. He over He had a cardiac arrest from hypokalemia, came in, got resuscitated, was doing pretty well, went to the CVICU, being evaluated for a bad, because his heart failure is so significant. Like, 39 years old, heart failure so significant. And then uh, he had a secondary consequence, had another cardiac arrest, did not get returned to spontaneous circulation for almost an hour, was on massive norepinephrine and epinephrine, woke up, went to Emory for ECMO, got ECMO, got extubated. Don't know what's happened now, but he survived all of that. But by the way, his cardiac arrest was because he was hypokalemic, because he was diuresing based on what they were telling him about being gaining weight and feeling short of breath. He over-diuresed himself. He knew he was supposed to take potassium, but it's really hard. It's bitter. It made his stomach upset, so he didn't take his potassium. And he knew it. When he woke up, he said, I over-diuresed. And I, I don't think he probably said, I over-diuresed. But he said, I made myself urinate a lot, and I didn't take potassium. That was stupid. That's what he said, I didn't say that. Okay, so remember that for most heart failure patients, we're gonna use a combination. We're gonna give them a loop diuretic because that's gonna cause aggressive salt and water wasting, but it also caused secondarily other electrolyte wasting. So we're gonna add in now a potassium sparing diuretic. Now that works much farther out in the kidney in the distal tube, so it's not such a strong diuretic, but it causes reabsorption of potassium in exchange for salt and water wasting. So it's a potassium sparing diuretic. We like to see those two together. And then we think about uh, metallosome, which is a thiazide diuretic. Again, thiazide diuretic is a pretty aggressive diuretic that works also at the loop. Then we think about vasodilators. And those vasodilators, we want them to have two purposes. Either we want them to be veno-arterial dilators, like nitroglycerin, we want them to be uh, diuretic plus dilators. That's your ACE and your ARBs. That's also hydrolyzine, which is why hydrolyzine is still a, a, a drug that's used a lot. Okay. And we're going to think about beta 1 antagonists to reduce the heart rate and the contractility. Okay. So vasodilators decreasing preload and afterload and oxygen consumption. ACE, ARB, beta blocks, nitroglycerin. Okay, and then inotropes. So the primary inotropes we talk about are sympathomimetics, that would be dobutamine. That's a pure inotrope. It's a beta-1 contractile, primarily beta-1 contractile, secondarily beta-1 heart rate, and at higher levels, a beta-2 stimulant, which promotes vasodilation. So what that means is when you start your patient on dobutamine, talking about in terms of a test, 
you start your patient on dobutamine of 5, 7.5, 10, what you might see is a significant increase in heart rate and a drop in their blood pressure. Okay, on a test, if the option is to reduce the dobutamine and give volume, that's what you would do. If the option is to turn off the dobutamine, that's what you would do on a test. If their option is not to give volume, to reduce dobutamine and give volume, which it won't be, it'll be turn the dobutamine off. That's what they're gonna ask you on the test. In your clinical practice, my friends, you should always have a discussion with your physician who has written for you to start dobutamine at five, 7.5, 10. The assumption being that's a really great dose for somebody who has heart failure because their beta receptor sites are insensitive. So you're starting at a higher level of stimulation at five, 7.5, 10. So if you have known heart failure, I'm happy to start you at five. I'm in the ICU and I'm starting you on an inotrope because I think you need inotropic support, but I don't think you have heart failure. I'm always going to start lower. That's your clinical practice. Here, it's about heart failure, five, 7.5, 10. Never really ever want to go above 15 to 20. And I would never want to go, never want to go above 15 myself. And you're not titrating dobutamine to the blood pressure. You're titrating it to myocardial contractility. Blood pressure is a secondary uh, effect. When you increase your systolic ejection, I mean, your systolic pressure went up, you've improved your stroke volume. That's what you're looking for with dobutamine. I have no idea what that is. Okay. The other agent is a vasodilating inotrope. So I want to make sure you appreciate that. That will be milrinone. Milrinone is a primary vasodilator and a secondarily positive inotrope. So it's a fantastic agent if I want to promote vasodilation as well as inotrope. But a lot of times, milrinone will have more vasodilating effect than it has inotropic effect. So you may need to give both of them to them. Okay? Because I want to reduce your afterload, I want to increase your contractility. So I can look at milrinone, milrinone plus dobutamine, dobutamine by itself. Milrinone by itself has a, a purpose in very particular categories, but in general, in general, we don't use milrinone as a standalone unless we know that you actually have significant vasoconstriction. And it's used very significantly when I have pulmonary hypertension. I can use milrinone as a primary agent because it causes very significant pulmonary dilation. Okay. Non-pharmacologic interventions, one of the most important ones, and we'll talk about this when we talk about pulmonary and ventilation, will be either if your problem is oxygenation but not carbon dioxide retention, you're hypoxic but not hypercorbic, you're going to go on CPAP. If you are hypoxic plus hypercorbic or hypercorbic only, you'll go on BiPAP. That's the only reason to make a difference between them. CPAP treats oxygenation only. BiPAP treats oxygenation and CO2 retention. So if you're retaining CO2 and you're hypoxic, you're getting BiPAP. Okay. And we can do this in a non-invasive method. We use EPAP. EPAP in parentheses is PEEP. It's expiratory pressure that keeps the alveoli open. EPAP treats hypoxia. IPAP actually is what determines your tidal volume. Tidal volume helps you remove CO2. So IPAP is titrated to your patient's CO2. EPAP is titrated to their oxygen. IPAP is titrated to their CO2 retention. And that's really straightforward. Now, heart failure is one of the primary indicators in the primary patient population that actually has good response to non-invasive ventilation. So when we see a patient who is struggling, he has dyspnea, he has failure of oxygenation and or he has CO2 retention, we have to think about these non-pharmacologic interventions that can actually assist the patient in better oxygenation 
for better oxygenation CO2 removal, which then reduces the burden on the myocardium, but not if they feel like they're suffocating. So one question you might get is you're gonna start your patient heart failure on BiPAP. What is the nurse's primary role? The nurse's primary role is to stay with the patient and encourage them to breathe, to relax. The single most important strategy in successful CPAP and BiPAP is a nurse working with the patient, keeping them calm, breathing with them. And that, I guarantee you, would be the question the ACN is going to ask you. They're not going to ask you about what you're going to titrate. They're going to say, how do you ensure the best application of BiPAP for your patient? Okay. So that's really, really important. Okay. All right. Something else that we might see for these patients is an ICD, implantable, implantable cardioverter defibrillator. And ICDs have a wire that is in the atrium as well as in the ventricle. And you're able to do atrial pace and ventricular pace and with a recognition of a wide QRS tachycardia, the initiation of internal cardioversion, okay, or defibrillation. If it's a VT or VF detection, you will defibrillate, and I'm sorry, I think I said that incorrectly, but let me correct myself. If you have atrial tachycardia, atrial flutter, rapid response, not wide QRS, but rapid ventricular response you'll do, you can actually cardiovert. But if you're in VT or VF, you will defibrillate. So recognition is about height and width of ventricular depolarization. Okay. And that's how it makes that sense. Okay. ICDs are really important. They are a significant movement forward in terms of treating patients with heart failure. And remember that a lot of times the patients with heart failure have intraventricular conduction deficits, and they have a lot of ectop. So ICDs can help them significantly in terms of reduction of sudden death. Something else that is uh, quite important is referred to as CRT, and that's cardiac resynchronization therapy. And again, we're talking about a patient who has heart failure who has intraventricular conduction deficits. So they must have a wide QRS. And typically, they must also have a YQT. That's the criteria. They have intraventricular conduction deficit with heart failure. So you've got heart failure and you have bundle branch block. We're going to consider cardiac resynchronization therapy. Now, we haven't seen a lot of that here at Grady. We have a new EP doc who is very into it. So you're going to see it a little bit more. These leads are really important because you have a lead both in the LV and a lead in the RV, as well as a lead in the atria. So that means we're going to resynchronize right and left ventricular conduction. So just taking a look at me, I'm going to step back, assuming you all can see me. So normally it's right, left, right, left, right, left, with no real delay, about a 0.04 second delay between right ventricular depolarization and contraction and left ventricular. When you have a left bundle branch block, it is right, left, right, left, instead of right, left, right, left, right, left. So now you're dyssynchronous in terms of your contraction. You already have heart failure and I have a dyssynchronous ventricular contraction that makes the heart failure worse. So CRT is a new evolution, but patients have to meet particular criteria. We don't put in just for heart failure. You put in for heart failure with intraventricular conduction deficit, either right bundle branch block or left bundle branch block. And that resynchronizes taking you now from right, left, right, left, I'm sorry, from right, left, right, left, or left, right, left, right, back to right, left, right, left, right, left. So I want to synchronize your ventricular depolarization and your contraction. And that's what we do with cardiac resynchronization therapy. It's a pacemaker, dual ventricular pacing. So just remind yourself of that. I've got a heart failure patient who has a transvenous pacemaker. Their right ventricle depolarizes first, their left ventricle depolarizes second, right? So that's dyssynchronous, but it's not terrible because the right ventricle contracted first, filling the left ventricle and then the left ventricle contracts. 
when you have left bundle branch block, left bundle branch block, the left ventricle contracts second. When you have a right bundle branch block, the left ventricle contracts first and the right ventricle contracts second. It can be very deleterious. So CRT is another form of therapy that we are looking at today. Something else that you might see, uh, really there won't be a discussion about this on your exam, and that is primary ultrafiltration. Here at Grady, we call it aquaphoresis. It is the removal of patient's fluid, but not necessarily using a vas cap. So we're in the ICU, we can put in a vas cap, we can choose scuff on our CRT device, that is slow continuous ultrafiltration, and the patient is filtering volume. Whenever you filter volume, some solutes go along, but that's not your purpose. You're just trying to remove volume. Um, but when we talk about as primary ultrafiltration for, uh, for heart failure, it is typically called aquaphoresis, we're pulling off water. Doesn't require a VASCAP if we're doing aquaphoresis. If you're doing it with a Prismax and your CRT device, you've got to have a VASCAP. But if you're doing it on 5A, you're, you're using, a, it's really like a pick line or a midline, not a VASCAP, and you're just taking the patient's own pressures to actually drive filtration, okay? It has not been shown by evidence to significantly impact incomes, uh, outcomes, incomes, outcomes, but that's what you wanna know. Okay, so we think about all of the things that we have to do and understanding that you're gonna be assessing your patient very frequently, you're looking at mental status, you're, you're really reminding yourself that as soon as you see a change in mentation in a heart failure patient, your assumption is that they've reduced perfusion to the brain. And that can be one of the earliest signs, right? So I wanna remind you that preservation wise with sympathetic activity, all blood flow shifts to the brain and the heart. I don't, I don't get it to the periphery. I'm not really having it to the skeletal muscles. I might not even have it to the mesenteric bed or the kidney, but I'm gonna have preferred blood flow redistribution to the heart and the brain. If I have a patient heart failure and I'm seeing more and more dysrhythmias, if I have a patient heart failure and I'm seeing a change in mentation, that means that I no longer have enough blood flow to maintain cerebral or cardiac function. That means this is impending doom, right? Oh, well, I'm looking at the monitor. I'm not that worried because you're having some frequent PVCs. No big thing. Uh-uh, you're in heart failure. You've got frequent PVCs. This is a sign of impending doom. You've got to do something about it right away, okay? And a change, of course, in mental status. Same thing. Very, very important. Heart sounds, S3 gallops murmurs, right? S3 plus S4 gives you lup dup 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 lup dup 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 lup dup 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 That's the gallop. Remember, S3 comes early in diastole, S4 comes late in diastole. We talked about that last week. Murmurs typically occur in patients with heart failure because they have dilated chambers and the valves don't close. And those valves will be the AV valves, tricuspid and mitral, okay? Talked about peripheral pulses, presence of edema, skin, temperature, color, moisture, and cap refill. For a long time, cap refill took a second, uh, second seat. It is now considered one of the most important evaluative tools to look at blood flow dynamics in patients. Non-invasive, easy to do, capillary refill always should be less than two seconds. Anything prolonged beyond two seconds indicates poor blood flow. All right, my friends. Uh, I think it's probably the, it's 10.01. So if I could take two more minutes and then I'll finish this part. So pulmonary effects, we've already talked about that. Now your lungs are filling with fluid because you have venous stasis in the pulmonary vein. So first you can see crackles. Secondarily, you can see a narrowing of the airway and that presents itself with wheezing. Patient may actually, because of that fluid extravasation in the interstitium, fluid starts to enter into the alveolus. You're not able to keep the fluid out. That's the purpose of surfactant, but the pressure of the fluid is so high, the fluid moves into the alveoli. So now your patient has frothy sputum because they have air and fluid mixing together and they're exhaling that or you're suctioning that, okay? GI, we already talked about, because you can have reduction of blood flow to the mesenteric bed and to the gastric organs. You have nausea, vomiting, diminished bowel sounds, decreased appetite. If you're in an ICU, probably don't really look much at your appetite. By the way, single, if you were asked for a nursing perspective, what is the single most important value in trending heart failure? 
as a nurse, what you are, when they ask that, is what you're in control of. You are not in control of labs. You are in control of calculating output. You are in control of weighing your patient. Daily weights and accurate urine output are what nurses are in control of when they're evaluating somebody with heart failure. So they might say, what is the nurse's responsibility in managing a patient with heart failure? BNP evaluation, sodium evaluation, potassium evaluation, daily weights. Read what's been said. What is the nurse's responsibility, right? That doesn't mean you're not looking at the labs. It doesn't mean the labs aren't important. It means you're in control of daily weight. That's under your domain. You don't need a doctor's order to weigh your patient. And you do it the same time every day. Okay. So that brings us to cardiomyopathy, which is just an explanation, a further explanation of heart failure. When we come together next week, we're going to review cardiomyopathy, peripheral vascular disease, aneurysms, VSD, and some of the electrical abnormalities of the heart. And that will, next week, We'll conclude our sessions on cardiology. I want to say thank you to everybody that was on board. Uh, I really appreciate it. I will try to get the handout to you a little bit sooner uh, so that you everybody has time to download it. There is, I will also, I realized I had a very significant ease of operation of putting up the recording and giving you the link to listen to the recording. So I'll get that out quickly as well. I wanna thank you for signing on. Thank you for coming here today. Thank you for caring for patients. Thank you for striving for excellence and considering taking either your PCCN or your CCRN. And thank you very much. And congratulations for surviving the two hours with me. Thank you very much, everybody. See you later. Thank you.